Did you not think people would find this out? You know, Pierce, not after you're I not, had... You're not wanting to be like a reality TV No, no, no I understand. Right? You know, if, you, if you were going on Celebrity Apprentice, which I went on, right? It doesn't matter. You can embellish stuff about it. So nobody cares, right? But to run for Congress of the United States and to just tell blatant lies about even your academic record, I'm just struck, not necessarily that a politician would lie, but that you would think no one would find out. Well, I'll, I'll humor you this. I ran in 2020 for the same exact seat um, for Congress, and I got away with it then, and I guess... Right. Well, that's honest. Stupid. So you thought, actually, they don't, they're not going to find out? No, I didn't think so. It's <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> I mean, Pierce Morgan is right. He was at least honest about, I got away with it before. I didn't think they'd catch me this time. You know, that's true. I have to say, now that I've experienced his honesty, go back to lying. <laughs> your honesty is crazy, man. As crazy as your lying was, your honesty is weirder. You've got the whole world to watch right now. Um, so I know you're a busy man. I want to start on Ukraine and Russia with this anniversary. Um, on the cusp of Russia's invasion, you flew to Kiev mm -hmm. and you told President Zelensky, tell me if this is right, the Russians are coming to kill you. Was that the very first thing you said? It wasn't the very first thing I said to President Zelensky, but President Biden had asked me to go to Kiev uh, to lay out for President Zelensky the most recent intelligence we had, which suggested that what Vladimir Putin was planning was what he thought would be a lightning strike from the Belarus border to seize Kiev in a matter of a few days, and also to seize an airport just northwest of Kiev called Gustamo, which he wanted to use as a platform to bring in airborne, airborne troops as a way, again, of accelerating uh, that lightning conquest of Kiev. And I think President Zelensky understood what was at stake and what he was up against. Our Ukrainian intelligence partners also had good intelligence about what was coming as well. But I do think think that the role of intelligence in this instance, what we're able to provide to President Zelensky, not just on that trip, but you know, throughout the course of the war, have helped him uh, to defend his country with such courage and tenacity. And I think that made a contribution early, you know, just before the war started. Being able to share that intelligence. Yes. You also have said, um, and tell me if this is correct, that it was only a group of about three or four people around Vladimir Putin who knew that he was actually planning this invasion. Mm -hmm. no, I I think that's true. I mean, I had watched over the years, especially over recent years, um, as Putin had narrowed his circle of advisors. Uh, and it was a circle in which he prized uh, loyalty over competence. It was a group of people who tended to tell him what he wanted to hear, and, or at least had learned over the years that it wasn't career enhancing to question his judgments as well. And so that was one of the deepest flaws, I think, in Russian decision making just before the war, as it was such a closed circle of people reinforcing one another's profoundly mistaken assumptions. To do something which I sometimes do, which is to make breakfast for dinner. Aunt Jemima, yummy pancake syrup. Now, this used to show a large African-American woman chef, but because of the inherent racism of Americans' corporate culture, they decided to make it a white person, or maybe no person at all. But I prefer it when it's a black person showing their incredible skill at making pancakes. So God bless you all. Actor Ben Stein says he misses the good old days when a, quote, large African-American woman was on his syrup bottle. But woke corporate culture ruins everything. And you may recall just a few days ago, he complained about a racial dictatorship while pan-searing salmon. So this old man yelling at a cloud while cooking could be a theme. But based on what he's saying, it's the opposite of let him cook. Benny here represents the long history of this beautiful country of ours pretending to honor black, brown, and native people by placing some version of their names, images, and likeness on logos and mascots. For instance, see the fact that there are no major American sports teams featuring a white person on a logo or mascot. Because I've said before, in a country like these United States, y'all mean to tell me that the people who carve themselves on mountains and place themselves on money don't want to honor themselves this way? And they desire to honor brown people? Nah, that don't seem right. Especially when you consider how it's usually done. Baby, you hungry? Let me fix you some breakfast. Aunt your mama? Did you know the name Aunt Jemima means slave name of the plantation south? Did you know the founder, Chris Rutt, a white man, got the name after attending a minstrel show? Think blackface. Did you also know he hired former slave Nancy Green to be his very own Aunt Jemima, where she went around cooking pancakes and telling people stories of the good old south? And afterwards, they could take home a box of Aunt Jemima and that feeling of having their very own mammy. Not today. Black lives matter, people. Even over breakfast. The two white men who created Aunt Jemima didn't want to honor Sarah Green, an ex-enslaved woman, by the way. They wanted to sell their product. Not that this is an argument being made, but more on this in a second. And while this did make Green some money along the way, keep in mind, the term Aunt Jemima is racist in and of itself. And she was personified as a mammy, which is racist in and of itself. And that goes for Uncle Ben, too. And look at Quaker Oates, maintaining his identity and personhood. With that said, if Ben Stein or woke corporate culture, whatever that is, wanted to truly honor Sarah Green so the history books don't forget her, or the other black women who portrayed Aunt Jemima, the idea of which came from vaudeville, they should know that Green's birthday is coming up on March 4th, I believe and the 100 year anniversary of her death is this year. How about PepsiCo and Quaker Foods do something commemorative for Sarah Green and her descendants? Place Green's actual image and likeness on the bottle, not a caricature, the proceeds of which should go to these black families, more than just leaving her face on a bottle to help with sales of syrup. Besides, if Ben Stein really wanted a black woman on the syrup, he would know that they're out there, but that's not what this is about, is it? He wants to honor himself by saying stuff about wokeness, I don't know. Have you met Anna Polina Luna? Whether or not you have, who she is may change, but you can find out more about her by watching this video. Find the link in the description below. And you can also find me on my YouTube channel, We Gonna Be All Right. As always, my architect knows Japanese. Apparently some students in California might be getting their sea legs soon, because the housing shortage in California has gotten so bad that one university is considering placing students on a barge on the water. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I have a momentous bit of news for all of you. I know. I hope everybody is sitting down because there is something that happened last night on the Tucker Carlson program that has absolutely rocked the Republican primary and is completely changing the dynamics. Vivek Ramaswamy has announced that he is entering the Republican primary. I've got some garbage for you uh, this week. My garbage person, uh, he's in here somewhere. I'm not sure. I, I, I smell the rotting, so I know he's down there. Uh, is Donald Trump once again? I just have to give him this great dishonor because, of course, he spent this week doing his little photo op where he goes to East Palestine, and I will grant him that it's good politics. And to the extent that people were aided by the fact that he brought some pallets of water yesterday on the show, I even gave him credit for that. And if that had been where it ended, he wouldn't be my garbage person. But he can't help himself. That's why he's a trash man. He had to go on Truth Social and bleed out. The viewership report, total people that saw the coverage, social and traditional, 178 million. So many people watched us. Oh, the ratings were great. Everyone loved it. I don't even know if those numbers are honest. Um, it probably burns inside him too that apparently um, uh, the three major cable news networks uh, ignored live coverage of his photo op in East Palestine. Um, there, was, there was some coverage on Newsmax and OAN, so I guess that's good. He attacked Fox News as not covering him nearly enough. But we all get that this is a photo op. We, we get that. But to make it so obvious that you are one day later bragging about the social media engagement, those people are still as terrified about the future, about the state of the environment there, about their ability to continue to live there as they were the day before. But he has so fully moved on that he's like looking forward to Emmy season or something. David, what do you think? <laughs> so that's a good choice. And I, you know, I, I totally, I, I think it's so interesting because I think Donald Trump did the wise thing politically to go to East Palestine and to you know buy McDonald's for the fire, you know, for everybody who was there and the cleanup crew. That's fine. But again, he, to your point, he can't help himself. He has to take it to the next level where he shows what a fraud and what a narcissist he really is. And my fear in terms of politics is that Donald Trump was always, if he was ever just the person who just did that first thing, just the sort of first initial political instinct and yucked it up in East Palestine and left it there, he would be a real dangerous political threat because he's already incredibly charismatic. He certainly has certain political instincts. But thank God he shows himself to be the sort of garbage person who's so full of himself and full of his own narcissism and full of his own I'm the greatest because that shows you know what a, what a joke he really is and how he really does belong in sort of the dumpster of American society and it's it's embarrassing it's embarrassing this guy was president it's embarrassing this guy's running for president again 20 years ago we would have laughed off the stage somebody who did these kind of antics but every day it's just sort of like oh, that's Donald Trump yeah a little bit more normalized a question from Renee uh, Maris my apologies if I've mispronounced that. Why is there silence regarding Mark Meadows and the January 6th investigation at the DOJ? Well, good news. And of course, this question was posed before this news broke. But Mark Meadows has now officially been subpoenaed by the United States Department of Justice. So the silence is broken. Mark Meadows is likely going to face justice. Thank God. But the subpoena is just the beginning. There is going to be a legal challenge to it because that is what all of Donald Trump's people do. They don't ever want to cooperate. They want to obstruct. They want things to not happen. So Mark Meadows is going to fight this. But this is the dude. Listen. He's been at the heart of all of this. He was the epicenter of that entire scandal. So if they can crack that nut, and I don't mean nutty as in crazy, I just mean, you know, the metaphor, crack the nut. If they can get there, if they can get that information out of him, then at that point, it's full steam ahead straight towards Donald Trump. So there's going to be a fight. They're going to have to take it to court. It could take weeks. It could take months. But he can't fight it forever. And he can't win those fights. I think he knows that. The smartest thing for Mark Meadows to do is to approach the DOJ and say, hey, um, how about a deal? That's what he needs to do right now. This is Hattie. Hattie wants to know why you have not subscribed to our channel. You obviously like our videos, so do us a favor and subscribe. Kyle Rittenhouse is back in the news because he needs your money. This guy who has attempted to make an identity and a career out of the fact that when he was 17 years old, he brought an AR-15 style rifle to a protest in Kenosha and killed some people, uh, now says that his legal fees are getting too high, and so you guys need to bail him out again. Um, how are they having other case? Well, here's what is going on. So it was initially fired by Anthony Huber's father, John Huber, back in 2021. It draws a link between Rittenhouse's actions and those of law enforcement present at the scene of the protest. They accuse Kenosha police officers of allowing a dangerous situation that violated his son's constitutional rights and resulted in his death. Also alleging that Rittenhouse, who claimed that he acted in self-defense, was not found guilty of murder back in 2021, conspired with officers to harm protesters. So, um, I, look, I'm not on their legal team. I, I hope that goes without saying. Um, but the basic idea is... He and other people are marching around with guns that they have no reason to have there unless they intend to shoot someone uh, with an incredible jovial relationship with the police who are giving him water. And after he shoots people, he just gets to walk away with his AR-15 from the site of a shooting. There seemed to be coordination, at least in some fashion between them. I'll leave it to the legal proceeding to figure out exactly what that is. But they're not simply suing just because he killed people, but because of the environment that was created by law enforcement leading up to the killings. You're watching the legal breakdown. So, Glenn, we know that Jack Smith subpoenaed Mike Pence, and Mike Pence has come out and vowed to fight that subpoena. But that's led the special counsel to do something what you've called unheard of in prosecutorial circles. Can you expand on that? Yeah, you know, Brian, usually when we have a witness we want to put before the grand jury, and the witness has privileges that they want to try to invoke to keep from having to testify before the grand jury, we put them in the grand jury, they testify, and it's a very long, drawn-out process. Jack Smith just turned that on its head. He said, we're not going to go through all that. We're not going to wait. We're not going to drag this out. And he filed a preemptory motion with the chief judge, Beryl Howell, who has supervisory responsibility over the grand jury. 
And he said that he wants Judge Beryl Howell to rule up front that Mike Pence has no privileges. Now, this would be like if Jack Smith was a major league baseball pitcher and he was striking people out while they were still sitting in the dugout. I mean, before they came out, approached the plate for their at bat. This is not the way it's ordinarily done. And it's just it tends to show that Jack Smith is going 100 miles an hour in some really unorthodox ways in the direction of justice. So it's this kind of thing where he's going to go in and he doesn't want to give an extra inch because if he gives an extra inch voluntarily without being uh, obligated to do so by the judge, then anything he gives voluntarily, Trump can turn around and basically, you know, uh, jump down his throat for having done that. He can. And but think about this. Let's assume Mike Pence runs this to ground and he invokes every privilege known to man to try to keep from the grand jury incriminating information about Donald Trump. And he loses all of those privilege battles and the judge orders him to testify. And then reluctantly, he tells the grand jury about Donald Trump's crimes. Donald Trump is still going to jump down his throat. Right. And I don't think anything Mike Pence can do will curry favor with Donald Trump's base, because let's face it, they were the ones who wanted to hang him on January 6th. I can't imagine he's going to rebuild a bridge back to those people. Well, I don't know. There might be some constituency for Mike Pence within the hang Mike Pence party. So that remains to be seen. When it comes to investigating the crimes of the ruling class criminals, the rich, the powerful, the influential, the connected, the political, boy, DOJ tends to sit back on its heels, do the ultra conservative thing and take its time. Jack Smith is doing the opposite. He is going 100 miles an hour in the direction of holding the ruling class criminals accountable. And I know we've been waiting for justice for a very long time. But given everything I see out of uh, Jack Smith, I'm starting to feel like maybe there's a little bit of justice kind of peeking out over the horizon. Basically, what strikes me about all of this is that Merrick Garland had exponentially more time than Jack Smith has right now. And yet in the short amount of time that Jack Smith, Jack Smith's been here, the fact that he's been able to push forward with all of these things that ostensibly should have happened under Merrick Garland kind of just goes to show that that a lot of that time wasn't even used when Merrick Garland should have been moving forward on this stuff. When you, when you realize that Jack Smith was only appointed a special counsel on November 18th, yeah. three months ago, and look at just some of what he's done that, I'm sorry to say, Merrick Garland and company failed or neglected to do from subpoenaing a former vice president to subpoenaing a former chief of staff to the president of the United States to subpoenaing a White House counsel and a deputy White House counsel and the president's daughter and the president's son-in-law and the president's criminal defense attorneys, which I'm telling you, that's another sort of, you know, a nine on the legal Richter scale, because usually we do not subpoena the criminal defense attorneys representing the target of our criminal probe, the person we're intending to indict for obvious reasons. They would have an attorney client privilege. Jack Smith is going 100 miles an hour, as I say, in the direction of accountability. Yeah, it's kind of crazy when you say that out loud to, to hear how many people were left untapped uh, in all of that time is kind of, uh, you know, it, it reeks of malpractice.